Welcome all. Can you come? Can you come, Jeremy? Um, welcome all, and uh, welcome uh, to those joining online. Uh, my name is Professor Alan Duffy. I'm a PVC flagship initiatives. I am also a space nerd. Uh, I'm very excited for today's talk. We'll hear about some of the research going on at Swinburne to use the materials of the moon to try to advance humanity's exploration of our solar system. This work is uh, being undertaken by uh, Professor Jeff Brooks, a professor of engineering at Swinburne, uh, a background in extractive metallurgy and sustainable metal production. He recently won the Bessemer Gold Medal uh, for his contributions to the international steel industry, which is uh, essentially the Nobel Prize of steel. Is that fair enough? Except for when you would get the Nobel Prize for the green steel <laughs> research that you're doing right now. Um, he's turning these world leading skills honed here on the earth to the moon. And Belinda Rich is a PhD student within Jeff's extraterrestrial uh, processing group uh, in the Space Technology Industry Institute. Her research focuses on investigating potential casting methods for manufacturing aluminum wire on the lunar surface. She has a background uh, master's in materials engineering from the University of Birmingham in the UK and has previously worked for the European Space Agency developing new concepts for lunar habitats. Now before I get them up to speak I'd like um, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of which we meet the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here or indeed in the lands from which you are joining us online. This is not the sole Science Week talk, however, that Swinburne is participating in. There are at least two, <laughs> just think there's probably more, left. Well, certainly left, okay. So we have the Science in VR. Uh, this is, uh, Cyber is a um, virtual reality experience. You can explore the universe from the comfort of your favorite brewery, which happens to be, by sheer coincidence, Burnley Brewing, where it is going to be hosted this Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, please do attend. Is that over 18s? We ever figure that out? No, all, all, all ages. Yeah, okay. Underage welcomes the um, accompanied by a guardian. Excellent. So all ages, absolutely welcome. Uh, you have to be accompanied by a guardian uh, or an adult if you are, of course, under 18. Um, for everyone else, beers in hand, explore the universe. It's great. And then uh, I will be speaking on Friday about the dark matter research that is underway in Australia. This is the mysterious stuff that makes up five times more of the universe than everything we can see put together. And yet we don't know what it is. It's kind of a fascinating ride and Australia is leading the way in trying to understand that nature. So again, please sign up for these talks. Now, let me throw to Jeff. No, Belinda? Okay. Oh, wait, did you want me to plug or do you want to plug? Oh, I'll okay. plug. Okay, all right, Belinda, round of applause, please. <laughs> and questions in, questions in the chat. Yes. People want to put questions if, in the chat. Uh, yes, well, there's Q&A at the end, I believe. Um, there is, I will ask you a May I just, if I click this, is that going to ruin everything? No, quite no. Okay, good. Um, Hi, uh, very, very pleased to be here. My name is Belinda um, and me and uh, Professor Jeff Brooks will be speaking today and we are representatives of the Swinburne lunatics, some of which you see here. My apologies to Matthew Humbert. I didn't have a picture of you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and we are the uh, self-professed lunatics of Swinburne University because we're all obsessed with the moon uh, and we are all researching uh, how to make it possible to go exist work research on the moon um because if you haven't heard it's true we are going back to the moon um so hopefully everyone in this room has heard uh we for several years now have been hearing lots of fantastic plans from various space agencies all over the world about plans to return to the moon um for many reasons one of those reasons is to uh as a jumping off point to then go on to Mars to further explore our solar system. Um, but there's also plenty of things we can learn from the moon about the solar system itself and uh, plenty of resources that we are interested in on the lunar surface as well. 
So it's very exciting times. Um, just to illustrate um, a little bit of what's going on, we're in a sort of a new space race at the moment. So um, uh, hands up, has everybody heard of the Artemis mission? Okay, good, 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 good. Um, so yeah, NASA's Artemis mission, the next one will be Artemis three, which is scheduled for 2025. We'll see if that happens. Um, and they are scheduling the next crewed mission to the moon, the first woman and the first person of color to be on the moon by 2025. Very, very exciting. Um, but we also have other players in this race as well. So um, has anybody heard of the Chinese National Space Agency? OK, a few last hands. But um, this is a plan put forward by the Chinese uh, Space Agency for what will be the so-called International Lunar Research Station. Um, and they're proposing their phase one of this big, big project will be completed by 2030. Um, and that is actually to put the foundations of a lunar research base on the moon. So we can see that, uh, you know, we've got next crew to be on the moon, but first base to be on the moon. We've got lots of, lots of uh, interesting ideas being uh, presented and put forward by several nations at the moment. We also have, um, sort of more uh, blue sky concepts. So this is the ESA, uh, the European Space Agency Moon Village concept, which was developed in 2020. And I actually had the privilege of working at the European Space Agency when that was going on. So I got to witness that being developed firsthand. It was really, really cool. And they brought in all sorts of expertise. So architects and system engineers, thermal engineers, power engineers, all came together in one room for two really intense really stressful weeks to develop a concept for a moon village that could actually work. And that it has been the jumping off point for a lot of other uh, programs that are being proposed at the moment. And then last one, has anyone heard about this, which launched one month ago, Chandrayaan-3? Yeah. So this is from the Indian Space Research Organization. Very exciting. And uh, this is a um, lander, which contains a payload of a rover which will rove the moon and explore and uh, teach us about uh, sort of the water, the ice composition on the moon, um, teach us about the regolith composition, um, more about regolith in a minute. So a lot going on. It's a really exci exciting time to be interested in space, a really exciting time to be working in space. And so that is why we are so interested. Um, so we're the lunatics, but our more official name is the Extraterrestrial Resource Processing Group. I think I got that right. Um, and that is because uh, resources on the moon are the way forward and manufacturing on the moon is the way forward. So there's plenty of stuff we're going to need in order to sustainably operate and work on the moon. So um, the very obvious one is habitats. Um, this is a sort of artist's impression of what a lunar habitat might look like. Um, and also sort of rovers and other um, sort of images that we're more familiar with. But then there's more logistical things that we need to uh, develop approaches for. So uh, things like electrical infrastructure, uh, pipelines for piping gas and water and whatever else we need. Um, launch pads. Launch pad technology is going to be a huge one um, in order for us to safely and non-destructively land and launch from the moon. Um, again, solar, uh, solar arrays, which tie into the electrical infrastructure, um, and also facilities for things like 3D printing. This is uh, wire, uh, wire additive 3D printing, which is going to enable us to uh, repair, to develop tools in situ on the moon without bringing things from Earth. And the thing is, is Throughout human history, we have been defined by manufacturing advances. We have the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, but all of these thousands of years of history of manufacturing space presents an entirely new challenge. And that's the most exciting part. Um, so some of these challenges you might have heard of. Um, so I've listed a few of them there. There are probably more beyond what I've listed, um, but these are some of the things that we have to consider when we're developing technologies that are going to be applied to the moon. So first off is radiation. So the moon has no atmosphere. Uh, on Earth, we have this lovely atmosphere blanket. 
uh, on the moon, we're going to be exposed to a cosmic radiation dose, which is 1,000 times the annual dose that we receive on Earth. So that's pretty, uh, pretty extreme. On top of that, we're also going to receive a very strong UV dose as well. So we need to be able to protect ourselves, but also protect the equipment and the technologies that we're launching and leaving on the moon. Uh, the next one is the diurnal cycle, which is what we call the day-night cycle of the moon. So um, does anybody know how long it takes for the moon to do one rotation? A month, exactly. So it takes one month for um, the moon to rotate once, which means we have two whole weeks of lunar night, which is significant challenge because if you're relying on solar panels for your electricity, when there's two weeks of night, what are you supposed to do? Um, and alongside that, we have very extreme temperature ranges from uh, plus 123 to minus 178. It can even get it can get even colder in um, permanently shadowed regions of the moon as well. So our technology needs to be able to survive this. Um, on top of that, we have very very high vacuum on the moon. So three times ten to the minus 15 atmospheres. So we have one atmosphere here on Earth. This is this is very significant vacuum. This is extremely hard for us to replicate even here on Earth. So a vacuum like that on the moon has a lot of implications for uh, any sort of processing or manufacturing. Um, does anybody know how much the gravity is on Earth? Uh, on the moon, sorry, compared to Earth? One six, yeah, fantastic. This is a pretty common one that people tend to know. <laughs> um, and we've all seen those videos of, of people jumping around on the moon and, and it looks very silly, but this also has implications for our rovers that are gonna drive around and any sort of uh, structural uh, construction or structural apparatus that we're gonna be using. Um, there's also things like, how are we gonna provide oxygen, water, electricity to support ast not only astronauts, but also uh, in terms of electricity and maybe some of our processes need an ambient oxygen environment to operate. Um, and we can't necessarily rely on earth to supply these things because as we very well know, it costs a lot of money to launch things into space. And it's a very time consuming process as well. Um, and then the last one that a lot of people may not uh, know or consider is the lunar dust. Um, so uh, if you've ever sort of seen pictures from the Apollo missions where uh, these astronauts are absolutely covered in dust, well, I'll show you now, it's very not pleasant. This is a picture of Eugene Cernan from Apollo 17. Um, and their lunar module, uh, the way that worked is that their entire module was an airlock. So they had nothing to protect them from the dust coming in when they came into their module. And they really suffered from the impact of this dust. I wonder if I can move this so you can see the full quote. Um, but Eugene Cernan says that dust is probably gonna be our greatest inhibitor to operations on the moon. Um, and it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty, nasty problem. Lunar dust is very, very abrasive. It's extremely sharp. If that gets into your lungs, that's going to cause a lot of damage. Um, the also very fun, exciting thing about the moon is that the lunar dust is charged. So we have this effect where the dust actually levitates off the surface. So it's pretty unavoidable. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about that today. If you have questions about that, I encourage you to talk to Philip, who's in the audience, who is solving our dust mitigation problem here at Swinburne. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you, you get the sense that uh, there's a lot of challenges going on. There's a lot of problems that we have to face. So I'm just going to move this back. So how do we approach this? How are we going to go to the moon sustainably? What's going to be our way forward? So one of the things, and what I believe is going to be the way forward, is this acronym ISRU, which stands for In Situ Resource Utilization, which is just a very fancy way of saying using the stuff where it already exists. And what stuff exists on the moon? Lunar regolith, which is what we call lunar dust. And lunar regolith is fantastic. There's loads of it. Uh, it's, we probably will never run out. And it's full of really, really useful stuff. So this is a sort of demonstration of the mineralogy of lunar regolith. So um, 
anorthite, pyroxene, olivine, ilmenite are all uh, minerals that we see on Earth as well, but they are very, very prevalent on the moon. And from these, we can extract all of these elements. So a big one in the middle here is oxygen. Very, very interested in oxygen for very obvious reasons. We love oxygen to breathe. We can also use oxygen to make fuel. But once we've extracted the oxygen, we have all of this fantastic stuff left over. We've got things like iron, titanium, aluminium, and that can go in to make all sorts of things. So um, once you've got the metals, the very obvious uh, route would be to make metal products from that. But we can also look into making things like semiconductors in silicon or making ceramics for construction. So at this point, I think I'm going to hand over to Jeff, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about how we make those ceramics and metals. Thank you. Oh, Belinda, uh, wonderful job. We'll get Belinda back, I promise. And I, I do want to issue a public apology to Matthew Humbert for not having his photograph. It's not that you're not photogenic, man. We just couldn't find a photograph. So um, we'll bet you on the next one, on the next list of people. Um, it's my excitement to lead the, uh, the Lunatics group. I mentioned before we started, just something, a bit of interesting information to everybody. The Lunatics group, the extraterrestrial processing, is our formal name, was actually initiated by a student. It wasn't formed by a professor or a strategic planning committee. It was actually formed by a student saying, I think the moon's really interesting and getting me involved and Akbar Ramdani involved. And it's grown to this group. So it's quite an amazing idea. So please don't believe that Swinburne students don't have an impact. It's not true. They can have a, quite a big impact. Um, we're going to talk about now how to make things. This is my, what my career has been about, how you make things. When you think about humanity, humanity Basically, we were belting each other with rocks and sticks for quite a while until we decided that we could make ceramics. And that's a very important advance. And then we, made, we learned how to make ceramics. We actually have a whole, a whole period of human history named after that called the Neolithic Age, which literally stands for new rocks. So that was a tremendous breakthrough because we were able to store food, able to do all sorts of things with ceramics. Then the next step was making metals, and that has caused an enormous revolution. Well, this revolution is going to happen in a hurry on the moon. We're going to do it all at once. But step number one is to make a ceramic. Because if we can make a ceramic, we can make a building, we can make uh, launch pads, we can make all sorts of things. And so making a ceramic is the starting point. And people have been making ceramics from lunar type materials because fortunately, the lunar materials, this lunar regolith, is quite similar to minerals we have on the, on the Earth, in particular basalts. And basalts are normally formed from lava flows, right? The leftover of lava flows. And these basalts are actually quite prevalent in Victoria. It's quite easy to find materials not unlike the moon in Victoria. And you can get these basalts and try to make them into ceramics. Now, I, I want to sort of emphasize to you that when you go to Bunnings on weekend or some shop like that, look at the cheapest, nastiest looking ceramic. It's probably made from a basalt. <laughs> so it's not the most beautiful aesthetic looking material, as you can see but you can make a functional, decent ceramic. What people around the world are doing or what we're trying to do is find ways of making these ceramics from regolith materials that are both practical on the moon, but also have good properties, right? That's what we're trying to do. Now, when you look at uh, making ceramics, you're using the process of sintering. And here's a nice diagram showing you what's going on in the sintering. Basically, particles are next to each other. Under heat, they start diffusing and combining together. And with a bit more, you densify and you get a you know you get a, a nice ceramic. That's the ideal. So we're looking at how to do that with three major techniques. One is electrical heating, standard furnace, and then solar energy. And because as you've just heard, and Belinda explained very, very well, solar energy is in abundance on the moon and is an obvious source of energy. There's no clouds, you don't you have 14 days of solid sunshine, right? It's essentially like going up to a holiday and it's no 14 days of sunshine, no, no party the whole time along. From a solar perspective, there's lots of energy. And the other one is microwaves. And microwaves are really interesting. People have long put forward the idea of using microwaves for industrial applications on the earth, but they actually have had quite limited applications. And one of the reasons why is it's a little bit expensive compared to other ways of doing it. But on the moon, it may be quite a practical way of doing it. It's really could be a very versatile heating technology, which I'll explain a bit further about. All right, now, how do we, how do we simulate solar energy in our lab? Well, we don't uh, run out and get a whole lot of mirrors and shine them all at one spot. We actually get cinema lamps to impersonate the sun. 
And this is the solar thermal facility at Swinburne. And we can impersonate over a thousand suns by shining seven cinema lamps at one spot. Right? And we can get well over 1500 degrees C in that spot. Right? We get some serious solar flux. I want to assure everybody we do not let students into the room while that's on, just so you understand. We don't sacrifice students at this place. Um, but we can, with two of them, get up to 900 degrees. Two cinema lamps shining at one spot, you can get up to 900 degrees. It's quite extraordinary. Huh? So anyway, it's basically a controlled sun, essentially. This is what this really is. And I should say something to be proud of. I'm very proud of. Me and Ben Ekman designed this thing. And Ben Ekman and I had never done any particular study on... <laughs> on optics and this is now a unique design that other people copy so i'm quite proud of that my little foray into intense uh, solar optics and uh, we use this for these kind of studies now when we first started doing this we'd get some basalt type material we'd stick it in this in this furnace and we'd make a very unimpressive ceramic one on the right on the, on the right hand side there it was weak crumbly and not very good so we went right back to basics. How do you how do you how do you improve a ceramic, right? There's a number of things that can improve a ceramic. One thing is the way that the particles are combined. If you can get the particles interlocking with each other, the different sizes, then you've got a better chance of getting a, a, a final better product. If you can take out some of the very large particles that distribute that break up the network, you can also get a nice sintered sample. So we started looking at things like that. And we went to a lot of trouble. We actually started modeling the way that the porosity and uh, the way the porosity of a center develops with solar radiation. Now, we did this for, in the case of the moon, but this work was so was very nice work done by a student called Yuan Kun Zhang. He's quite a brilliant student and a, and a great guy. And Yuan Kun did such a good job. It was published in the top journals in the world of heat and mass transfer because it was really a, a very fundamental study of how you can center materials. And he was able to predict center density and was able to improve the strength by applying these principles. And we dramatically improved the strength by putting different combinations of sizes. And we started to get also a thicker sintered material. This is quite important because um, regolith um, is very, got very low thermal conductivity. So in other words, it's really hard to get the heat into it. And we're trying to look at a way of being able to center large blocks say, to build a launch pad, right? So anyway, Yung Kun um, established this very well, and we've got quite good um, predictive power now of how to center these materials. So that was very exciting. And recently, we've got into microwave centering. Now, I want to just say, I want none of you to duplicate this at home, all right? <laughs> no duplication at home, all right? This is a scientific experiment. It may look like a domestic oven, and it is. <laughs> uh, here we are putting a, a piece of uh, pressed center, uh, oxide material into a vessel that's designed to accept uh, microwaves. And in 10 minutes, we've made a quite hard ceramic material. Just so you know, and I don't want you to duplicate this, I have made steel in a microwave. Please do not try that at home. All right, you can do it. I'm seeing some of you have an evil glint. I'm not encouraging you towards that, but just so you know you can. All right, so uh, we started making ceramics this way, which is very exciting. And then we, uh, I had a friend of mine who's really an expert in microwave centering, and we went right back to basics to try and improve it. So what we looked at doing, and this is actually results done yesterday. This is done by <laughs> a final year student, who, uh, Locke, and he very nicely uh, got these charts ready tonight. He, I said, well, we can improve the strength by trying to uh, basically prolong the time at temperature and then make it cool a bit slower because we know that in traditional ceramics that increases the strength. I should tell you, a long, long time ago when I was a practical engineer, I built big kilns for making ceramics. So this is something I've been you know, busy with. And um, so he came up with this heating cycle with a microwave and he also measured the temperature. He's found a good way of measuring the temperature. And you can see then from the left down to the bottom, He's increased the peak strength by at least a factor of about four or five, just by applying some simple principles of longer duration and trying to control the cooling. So we're going to get clever and clever at this, right? We're going to keep pushing that up. This is just the start. So we're quite excited by that. Now, uh, this is my chance to talk about one of my heroes. So not, not, not Bob Dylan. I'm known to talk about that for quite some time. And 
I can also talk about my favorite hockey player, but I want to talk one of the great unsung geniuses. That this is a person who is, I think it's not too much to say, idolized in the materials community, um, in chemistry as well, and for some reason not in the general public. Let me tell you a bit about this person and how we use his ideas, which are amazingly powerful. This is one Joshua Wilford gives. And he was the first person to get a PhD in engineering in America. Full stop. The first person. He was the fifth person to get a PhD in all in any topic in America. So he was very early in the days of PhDs. And he worked at Yale. And he was a very quiet man. Apparently a very nice man, but very quiet, very reserved, and extremely uninterested in promoting himself, which is part of the reason we don't know so much about him. What he did in his spare time... He is the founder of chemical thermodynamics, the whole field of knowledge of chemical thermodynamics, which I can say is, I would say it would be reasonable to say he's the most important figure in the history of chemistry, full stop. That would not be an unreasonable claim. I think you know, not many people would dispute that. But he also is underpinning geology, chemical engineering, and most of material science. Right? But that isn't his only achievement. He also decided it would be really good to work out how, when you have millions and millions of particles, how the statistical behavior of them can explain the behavior of matter in general. That is itself an entire field of knowledge called statistical mechanics. He's one of the co-founders of that, all right? So, all right, you think, all right, that, that's showing off, right? That's like winning Wimbledon, you know, then taking on, the, you know, taking on the Tour de France. Yeah, he's done both of them. He also, for anybody here who's studied advanced mathematics, he is the founder of vector calculus. So any of you who have ever done a dot product or taken the gradient of a function, he's the man. He invented that. So for those who aren't, haven't done that yet, you'll get to it, all right? It's very profound insight into how to study both change and direction at the same time. Am I impressing you with this man's achievements? I will tell you a great quote. Albert Einstein once asked, who's the greatest American physicist of all time? And he said, oh, that's easy. Gibbs. He said, that's, that's unbelievable. That's not his only achievements. But his greatest achievement is Gibbs free energy. And I want to tell you straight away, he's not vain enough to name it after himself. That's a post you know, afterward. Right? And this is what it's about. I'll explain it to you. Let's imagine you're all molecules. And let's say um, Alan enters the room, all right? And Alan's moving around and he's not attracted to anybody. He doesn't want to go and sit with anybody. He doesn't want to do anything. He just wants to sit there. He's fine. And you all feel the same way. The Gibbs free energy of this system is zero. You're at equilibrium. Nothing's changing. It's all fine. Now let's say it's opposite. Let's say he comes in and actually, cause he comes from an Irish background and he sees that Linda's English. Great. I like English people. So he comes and sits down and <laughs> he comes in, he co for my story. He comes up and he cozies up to Belinda because he's he really likes to be together with Belinda. He's bonding with Belinda. So in this situation, we have a negative gives free energy, and the new equilibrium is reached when he sits down and they're, they're, they're bonded, right? So that we've got this, this, this chemical reaction. Now, this make a more complicated scenario. Alan comes in and he likes English people, but he's usually quite, he's also quite keen on Americans. He thinks Americans are really nice. So there's an American, I know there's an American sitting there. And he's actually drawn, but he's not sure well, where is he going to sit. It's unclear, right? We can resolve that through the calculations of these energies. And we can do these calculations for thousands of simultaneous reactions. To give you some idea, I once worked with some friends in physics, uh, Sarah Madison, in calculating the formation of planets in a protoplanetary system. And we successfully predicted the composition of the planets, right? Using this approach. But look at the equations. Look how easy they are. <laughs> and these equations really explain all of that. So it's an enormous insight, an incredible insight. And the first one, Basically, says gives you energy is equal to the enthalpy, which is essentially just the energy of Alan walking around the room, combined with minus the temperature times the entropy. And now the entropy is a more complex thing to understand, but the way I would describe it is if we had 10 Allens, which is a terrifying thought, <laughs> if we had 10 Allens and they were all holding hands in a very structured crystalline solid, they would have a low entropy. They would have low entropy. 
if, or other words, 10 Allens were running around madly around the room, being very extroverted and talking to everybody, we would have a large entropy. So entropy is a measure of randomness. It's a measure of disorder. And it gives great insight to realize what drives chemical reactions, that drives the formation of volcanoes and planets and happens in a furnace, is this balance between the energy of the individual uh, molecules and the way in which they order themselves. This is a tremendous, enormous insight, right? And we use this in all our calculations. This one here is a slightly more complicated version, not really much complicated. The, the change in Gibbs energy of a system is minus R, the gas constant, times times the log of K. K is essentially just the ratio of the products and the reactants of a, of a reaction. So if you know the Gibbs free energy, you can just look it up and you can calculate the ratio. That's what that is, just the ratio of products to reactants, very simple. Don't you love something that's profound, that's simple? <laughs> right up there with f equals ma isn't it it's just unbelievable right it's an incredible insight anyway we're going to use that to this next bit so people of course have gone to town using gibbs free energy right now this is just everybody wants to use gibbs free energy and most people who study materials chemistry geology such as study quite a bit about this so this is the gibbs free energy for different oxides and this is with temperature and what it's showing is is that these oxides, ClO, MgO, alumina, are extremely stable. They're really happy. The English and the Irish are sitting together and they're not getting apart. <laughs> Up the top, what we have is things that aren't as stable, right? Australians and English maybe. <laughs> and we're easily broken apart. That's the top. So these are the unstable oxides. And on this side, you can extend the idea to electrochemistry. You can also take it to the whole concept can be transferred to electrochemistry using the same stuff. And you can predict when molecules break down electrochemically. Same logic. It's the same basic idea. And these charts explain this. So suddenly, charts like this kind of explain most of electrochemistry and they explain most of the geology of the Earth, actually. It's extraordinary. All on this simple principle. Now, it's these things we need to understand if we want to uh, make metals on, on, on the surface of the moon. And there have been four or five major ideas put forward. Um, the ideas that are currently getting the most traction is electrolysis, all right? And so there are reasons for that. Electrolysis of metals on Earth is there's one major... What's the major metal that we make by electrolysis? Let's see, who knows? Matthew Humbert, you'd be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Yeah, we make one major metal, but most of the other metals we make by some sort of pyrometallurgical reaction, not by electrochemistry. Um, so electrochemistry systems on Earth have some disadvantages, but on the moon, these are not big disadvantages. They're actually some real positives of doing electrochemically. And there's two basic ideas floating around. One is doing it using the regolith as the electrolyte. So you, dis you actually use, you melt the electrolyte, uh, the regolith, you melt it, and then you put electrodes in it and you make metal, that concept. And the other approach is using some chlorides. Actually, it's a bit of a battle between two famous universities. Matthew's older mater, MIT. That's an MIT craze over there. And this is a Cambridge University craze. So it's basically Cambridge versus MIT. I think MIT is winning this one, this particular one. You might be biased, Matthew. <laughs> so MIT versus Cambridge. So they're... These are the two basic concepts that people are trying to pursue at the moment. There's some other ones which are using classic pyrometallurgy. And those are ones where you use a natural gas to react with the regolith to make a metal. Now we do that on earth already, right? That's a, that's a well-known way of making metals, but it has the disadvantage of we've got to get the natural gas up there. So where do we get the natural gas? That's a big issue with that idea, right? Then this one here is using hydrogen, which is also something that's getting a lot of traction on the earth at the moment to make metals using hydrogen. But that involves getting the water, breaking the water down, getting the oxygen using the hydrogen. So that is probably more plausible than using the natural gas, I would say, right at the moment. And then there's another approach, which is, well, why don't we just make the metals directly? So if you get metals and you heat them up high enough, they actually break down the oxides. And it's a particular property of the moon where we could actually do that, which I'm about to explain to you. 
So you learn more about power metallurgy than you ever wanted, isn't it? And gives free energy. <laughs> I, I'm just loving it. I've got a couple of my favorite, uh, my friends of physics here, and they're always telling me about you know, quantum mechanics and astrophysics. I was just dying to get into thermodynamics and <laughs> tell them about how great thermodynamics is. Um, as I said, it's this electrochemical approach has currently got a very, get a really um, strong push at the moment. Actually, we're working with one of the companies that's really pushing this called Lunar Resources. And there's another version of this called Boston Metals, which are trying to promote this uh, for general metal production on the earth. So this is a hot topic at the moment. For those who are interested in understanding you know, what's going on in the world, please look up Boston Metals and please look up Lunar Resources. And you'll see they're all building around this MIT idea about using the oxides as the electrolysis. And if we do this properly, we'll make oxygen, we'll make metal, and we'll then turn this metal even to something we're doing 3D printing with or directly cast into shapes that are useful. So we can start making wires, we can start making structural members, we can start making parts of ships. It's not, that's a quite plausible idea if we can, if we can get this process going. Now, here's the new, uh, more Gibbs free energy. I know you've had enough, more Gibbs energy. Actually, you can never have enough too much Gibbs energy. It's very good stuff. Uh, can I tell you, I worked at McMaster University for a while, and they have a very big material school there. And we used to have, a, we had a party on Gibbs' birthday with the whole school. We used to get together and go to the pub and celebrate his birthday. I think he wouldn't have approved. He was a bit of a teetotaler, as I understand, but that's a small problem aside. Um, so here we have this diagram redrawn for the moon because actually pressure plays a role in this. That previous diagram was for the earth. This is for the moon. And what you see here is you start seeing lines going above the zero. What that means is, is that the reaction is favored the other way. So down here, I was telling you before that lime's very hard to break down because it's down here. Up there, sodium and potassium and even some iron and manganese are predicted to go the other way. In other words, because of the vacuum of the moon, these oxides are less stable. You can start making metals just by making it hot, which you can't do on the earth very easily. So this is a special advantage of the moon. So I'll just repeat that so it's clear. On the moon, there's a high vacuum. That high vacuum means that it becomes thermodynamically favored to be able to make metals at a lower temperature. So there's something good about being on the moon compared to being on the earth. All right, that's basically what's going on. And we've done it. So Matthew Shaw uh, got some regolith type material and he heated it up and he made some small amounts <laughs> of potassium and iron, but he made some small amounts and he demonstrated the feasibility. What we found was it was very slow, which is we, I remember Matthew Humbert saying it was going to be very slow and I said, it's be slow, but it won't be that slow, but he was right. It was, it was a bit slower than I thought it was going to be. So it was slow, but it, it, we showed the principle. And we also demonstrated how to calculate the kinetics of the process. Because what's happening is when you get an oxide and you start heating it up, it starts sintering. You all know that now, right? You've all learned that it starts sintering. Because as it sinters, that blocks off the evaporation. So it's kind of like, it's like, kind of, it's like, kind of like trying to, uh, you know, dry out something when, the, when the, all the pores are disappearing, right? And this is what's going on. So it's basically, you're drying it out but you're trying to drive off these vapors, but it's all getting closed and you're getting less pores. So Matthew did a very nice job of understanding these playoffs and trying to see how this could work if we were, we were gonna upgrade this process. So it was a very nice piece of work and I'm very happy he got his PhD for working that all out. Now, I think you are escaping me talking about Gibbs free energy and we're putting it back to Belinda. I'm amazed none of you ran out of the room. <laughs> again <laughs> it's just your, your dulcet tones jeff they just attract people into the room um so that's all really cool we can actually make metals on the moon and the vacuum of the moon turns out to be really really useful in that um what are we going to do with that metal is the question um, and so that's a little bit about what i'm researching in my phd which is why i'm taking this section um, because we've got a lot of established work already um, on collecting regolith on the moon. That's essentially 
taking mining technology we have on Earth and applying it to the moon. We're really good at mining, Australia in particular, very good at mining. And we have these technologies that Jeff just explained all about how to extract and refine these metals. And then we also have ideas, what are the finished lunar metal products that we're going to want? So we know we're going to want electrical wire, we're going to want uh, structural parts, we're going to make parts of ships, as Jeff said. What is really, really missing in the literature right now is this bit in the middle. So how do we manufacture something useful? It's, it's all well and good taking a uh, regolith, electrolyzing it, getting a lump of metal out. But when we're on the lunar surface, we don't have all of the technology that is available to us on Earth to do that. And so that is what uh, my research area is focusing on. Um, in particular, I'm talking about electrical wires that we're gonna make from aluminium that we've extracted from the regolith. And the reason we want electrical wires is because every picture you see of the ISS is covered in electrical wires. You can barely count them in this picture. And electrical infrastructure is going to be so important, not just to keeping us alive, but for also <laughs> conducting the research that we want to conduct when we're on the moon. And we're not just talking sort of small level cabling here. We're talking long distance electrical transmission as well, because we envision that we would have large solar arrays, solar farms on the lunar surface. And we're going to want to transport that energy all over. So electrical transmission, very key technology that we're going to need for the moon. Um, and yeah, just this is just a cool fact. There's 13 kilometers of electrical cables on the International Space Station, which uh, I looked that up this morning and it blew my mind. So I thought you should all know that as well. Um, <laughs> and the other great thing are about developing the technology that we can use to make electrical wire is that we can then use that same technology of producing a very long, thin profile for making maybe structural beams, but also for 3D printing. So as I mentioned earlier, wire arc additive manufacturing uses metal wire, and we can feed that into a 3D printing process to develop rapid prototyping, uh, building any spare parts or tools we may need in situ. So the main thing uh, when we're talking about metals on the, moon, the lunar surface, so the molten regolith electrolysis process that Jeff mentioned earlier, the great thing about that is that the metal comes out uh, molten. So, fab, we don't need to heat it up again. It's already molten. We can do something with it straight away. Um, and when we've got molten metals on Earth and we want to cast them or shape them in some sort of way, uh, we need to remove that excess heat eventually somehow. And the rate at which we remove that excess heat is extremely important. That's going to determine so many things about our microstructure of our material, which is going to determine how it behaves, how strong it is, how uh, ductile it is, et cetera, et cetera. So on Earth, we have these sort of four... I just pressed something. I hope it's... <laughs> All good. Okay. Um, <laughs> on Earth, we have these four ways of removing excess heat. Uh, these, these are the sort of main heat transfer methods when you're talking about casting. Um, so, we'll, well, you may have heard of conduction, convection, and radiation, which are the, the three um, uh, heat transfer mechanisms. So conduction is just when heat is moving through a solid. Uh, convection is when a some sort of fluid is flowing and, and heat is traveling through a fluid. And then radiation is when uh, literally the heat radiates away. So uh, that's uh, separate to convection. Actually, heat can just transfer by itself without the action of any air present. Also something we have very much a lot of on Earth is water. And we love to use water cooling uh, when I think this is like a bearing uh, manufacturing plant that I found on the internet. We love to use water jets to cool, to control the, uh, the cooling rate, to control any sort of quenching uh, process that we've got going on. The problem with the moon is our our action of cooling, of removing excess heat, is extremely limited. We don't really have the water supplies that we have on Earth, um, and there is no air. So if we're talking about performing a manufacturing process on the surface of the moon in vacuum, there's no air to convect that heat away. So it begins to look a little bit more complex in terms of what cooling rates we can achieve and how that's going to affect the materials that we're able to make. Um, so the good thing, though, about space is that when we're radiating our heat away, 
the rate at which that heat is removed is very much dependent on the temperature that we're radiating into. So uh, does anybody know off the top of their head, what is the temperature of space? Or would anyone like to hazard a guess? Yeah? It's, it's like two degrees above absolute zero. That is, yes, pretty much exactly <laughs> right. That's is 2.7 Kelvin is the sort of average temperature of space and zero Kelvin is absolute zero. So it's pretty cold. It's great, fantastic. So we've got here, this is the Stefan Boltzmann equation, um, which talks about, this is the rate of heat transfer for uh, radiation. Um, and it's dependent on um, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, the emissivity of the material, which is how much it likes to radiate, the area that you're talking about. And then these two temperatures, this is the temperature of our material. Uh, sorry. Wait, yes, sorry. Temperature of our material and the temperature of space. Now, subtracting this, you can imagine if we're on Earth, that you know the ambient temperature is going to be quite high. It's going to be sort of room temperature. So this temperature that we're subtracting is going to be quite high, and this whole term is going to be, you know, sort of not as large as it could be if we're in space and we're only subtracting 2.7 Kelvin to the four versus 293 to the four. So you can see that the power of space and being on the moon means that we're able to radiate so much more effectively and much faster. Um, Unfortunately, it's not quite enough. It's not quite what we can expect from water cooling, but it is something that we can leverage and it's something that we need to consider when we're thinking about how we're going to achieve these cooling rates, what we can expect our metal to look like in terms of microstructure. Um, yeah. So, sorry, just, yeah, no, that's fine. So, I'll wrap it up because uh, I think we're going over time a little bit. Um, but those, that's just our major challenge of when we're talking about casting metals on the moon. But here are some other challenges which I think are quite interesting and that I am looking into researching right now. Um, so the first one is this phenomenon we have in casting called air gap formation, which means when you have a mold that looks like this and you have a sort of casting that's solidifying, what happens when things solidify is that they shrink. And when you've got a sort of mold surface that's quite um, defined geometry like this, the shrinkage of your metal is gonna cause it to pull away from the mold. That's fine. And that is a phenomenon that we know about. Um, but this thing here is called the air gap. Not too much of a problem on Earth. I mean, it does actually affect things uh, significantly, but it's something we can control for because it's exactly that on Earth. It's an air gap. It's got air. We can have conduction and convection in that space. But remember, on Earth, we don't have any convection. And so suddenly, this air gap becomes a vacuum gap. And this, the effect of this is going to be significantly greater on the moon. And that is something that uh, nobody really knows yet what the effect will be, um, and whether that is something that we can overcome, the effect of things pulling away from the mold. Uh, another thing that we need to consider is lubrication. So when you're, um, particularly in continuous casting, when you're pouring things into a mold, you quite often need some sort of layer in between that's going to uh, enable your material to release from the mold because otherwise uh, it could, well, on earth it could stick, but also in space we have this phenomenon called cold welding, which is where two metal surfaces that are contacting, uh, if there's, no uh, formation of an oxide on the surface layer, those two metals can just decide, we're just gonna stick together. There's enough uh, atom diffusion at that interface that things can stick together really, really easily in the vacuum of space. So we're gonna need to be able to lubricate the molds that we're using for casting in space. Um, but the problem is, is that a lot of lubricants that we like to use are things like grease, oil, uh, very volatile, compounds that can easily just evaporate away themselves. So again, another very unique challenge to space, one that we might not even need to consider as strongly on Earth that we have to overcome. And then the last thing is just automating this process. Um, automation on the moon and in space is everything. We can't have, as we might have on Earth, we have maybe some very physical hands-on uh, workers who can enable a casting process. 
I think the OHS uh, risk assessment form for sending astronauts to the moon to do some casting would just be way too long and way too expensive. So we're going to need to be able to automate all of this stuff in order for it to be viable. So that's a little bit about casting on the moon, which is the topic of my PhD. Um, and for the final section, I'm going to hand back to Jeff, who's going to tell you a bit about what to expect in the future. There is no mention of Gibbs, I promise. <laughs> um, right, so what's the future? Well, the first thing that I want to say is we need to sort out the legals on the situation of the moon. There is this space race going on. And basically, we're relying on a treaty from 1966, which is very broad and, and not very specific. And there's another attempt at a treaty, I think, in 979, and it went nowhere. In fact, all the made, only 18 countries have signed it, and they're all people who don't go into space. So, um, so it's a bit like me saying I'm not going to run for Wimbledon this year. I'm going to give somebody else a chance. It's that kind of problem. So um, we need some proper legals because we're going to start looking at resources on the moon. Some of these resources are probably not that serious. Like digging up a bit of regolith in, the, in some parts of the moon, I don't think it's a serious environmental issue at the moment. But digging up water, trying to mine for helium-3, I won't go into the details of helium-3, but helium-3 is something that people think could be very attractive to mine from the moon. Um, that starts involving quite large quantities of material. So now we're starting to talk about some serious degradation, and we need to look at it seriously and come up with some proper principles. So I think that's something that needs to happen. The transports of transport costs need to go to the moon. Now, that is making very good progress. People around the, uh, there's a lot of investment in large uh, rockets and transporters, and that cost will come down significantly. But it remains to see how reliable that is. It, it, it looks promising but it's still a major issue. People are talking of bringing the cost down to tens of thousands per kilogram instead of millions, you know, that kind of descending. It looks realistic, but it has to happen yet. So let's watch that space. Um, we need to have some sort of settlement up there to really understand how, how successful we can keep a habitat going there. And the plans that are forming are things like, well, let's start there for a few weeks and see how things go. And then start a bit longer and see how things go, et cetera, et cetera. And there's going to be some significant challenges, and there will be problems along the way for sure. In fact, there might even be some disasters. I hope not, but there may be. So we're going to have to get you know, confidence in being able to do that. And then once we've got confidence that we can keep human beings there, we'll need to start making stuff because flying up from the earth is a kind of uh, not a, a sustainable activity, but also we'll need to be starting to think about how we're going to get to Mars and other places and the moon is in the way, an intermediate base. So this is where all the thinking is. I, now, that's slightly incorrect there. I was speaking to Jerry Sanders, who's the main guy at NASA a few weeks ago, and um, he said 2032, actually. I shouldn't have said 2030. That's my fault. So he said, I reckon we'll start making ceramics and metals on the moon around about 2032, he, he was predicting. This is getting closer. Right? This is getting close. The people we're working with, the uh, lunar resources, they're talking about putting up sort of tests in about three or four years, payloads and, and trying these concepts out at small scale. Um, I think something else that we need to be there is let's make the ceramics first. Let's be clever. Let's learn from human history on Earth, right? Ceramics first, metals next. You know, it's, it's an obvious way forward. We need to get good at being able to melt and you know, process uh, center ceramics. And then we can start thinking about making metals. And I think that's what's going to happen. I really do think that's what's going to happen. Um, another big issue is junk. Now, some of the junk is going to be easy to recover. So we, we on the moon, there's quite a few bits of leftovers of spaceships laying on the moon. But these are made of quite useful things, aluminium and, and such things. So once we've established a way of melting and processing materials on the moon, it's quite realistic to, to recover that and you know make useful things out of it again, like we do on the Earth, right? And I think we have both a ethical responsibility to do that but i think we all are moral i suppose it moral ethical moral and ethical i'll say i'm not sure either. and but we also need uh you know it's a practical thing like why would we bother going to all the trouble of smelting for aluminium if there's a great few tons of aluminium laying not far away that makes uh, good sense right um but i think the orbital debris around going that is a much more serious problem in my view because the financial incentives of recovering that are much, much lower. In fact, maybe non-existent. But if we just keep filling up outside the earth with all our junk, it's clearly not a good thing from any perspective. So that's something that we have to come to grips with, I think, also. This is going to be viable. 
but there's quite a bit of junk to clean up already before we start making more things I would put forward. Um, the most obvious conclusion, it's an incredibly exciting time to be involved with space research. Um, my father worked for NASA in the 60s, and he'll tell you that that was the, the greatest time to be in space research, and maybe it was. But I reckon the next 10 years is going to be absolutely incredibly interesting. There are so many challenges of a scientific, technological you know, uh, manner. It's uh, and legal and moral and philosophical, all sorts of issues going on. But an incredibly exciting time. So I hope we've given you an idea about some of the challenges. And thank you for coming out and listening to me raving on about Gibbs and Belinda describing space research to you. Uh, we appreciate you listening to us very much. Very nice. Um, yes, I was about to say, I hope, well, I'm grateful that, that Jeff, your knowledge of metallurgy is better than your knowledge of bilateral relationships <laughs> between Ireland and England. Um, we haven't got any questions online yet. Just a reminder to the online participants, I can see there's about 15 on there. Um, put it in the chat or the Q&A. And as a little reminder, Australia is part of the Mission Back to the Moon, Project Artemis, and we have two uh, lunar rover concepts uh, that will be down selected in the next year. So we will actually be building a rover to do some of this experimentation. Australia is going to be part of that return. Um, all right, questions in the audience? Right at the back on the right, Sam. Oh, okay, well, it's gone to Rebecca, that's fine. Oh, sorry. And you, Sam. All right. Sorry. Um, so I wanted to know, it's fantastic to see the potential uh, metals that could be created on the moon, but I'm just curious, just how much regolith would you need to make, let's say, even a um, usable amount of, you know, this electrical wire? So it's one thing to think about the process, but then how much of it are we going to, you know, to have to chop the moon in half just to make one cable or how much? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, the regolith is quite rich in iron and it's quite rich in silicon. So in other words, you're probably making, you probably dig up three kilos to make a kilo of iron, for example. So not wonderful, but not, not as good on the, on the earth. It's more like 1.2 to one, right? But all right, so it's not a really rich ore, but it's not too bad. Where your point comes into play is titanium and, uh, and aluminium, especially titanium. Actually, I'm hoping that, I'm, I would advocate that, gee, yeah, aluminum as the iron and uh, silicon are pretty useful. Why don't we <laughs> utilize them um, and before we start? And it's also chemically harder to make titanium. If you looked at the Ellingham diagram, you see titanium's down a fair way down. So I think iron and silicon is a way to minimize that issue that you're raising. But it's a valid issue, especially if we start making any, any significant tonnages. At the moment, we're talking about you know, just a few tons, so it's not a significant issue. But if it gets more than that, what you raise there is quite a valid issue. If I may add, um, aluminium is the third most abundant uh, metal in lunar regolith, but yeah, as Jeff pointed out, iron and silicon are way up there and then aluminium's lagging a bit behind. So um, it also is very, uh, the composition of the lunar surface is extremely variable. So um, it's different depending if you're um, on Highlands regolith or Mare regolith and just locally uh, different compositions. So it depends a little bit where we're gonna land and start work. Thanks for a fantastic talk. I love the, the tag teaming, it was excellent. Um, Belinda, your, your, question, your challenge looking at cooling down this molten material, um, is there any possibility to use like low melting new techniques? Like we have low melting solders at around 300 degrees. Can we do something in that space rather than using water? Is that a possibility? That is uh, a very good question. <laughs> That's actually a fantastic idea. Um, I think just in general, the, um, the, the goal is to reduce any sort of supply from Earth. So, so once, we've, uh, once we've situated a process on the moon, we want it to use as few consumables as possible, which is the whole point of getting rid of water. Um, I mean, that, yeah. Yeah, just a, uh, sodium is a possibility. Um, you can get sodium from the regular earth, and molten sodium is currently used in um, solar applications and nuclear applications as well. Um, <laughs> for those who aren't aware, uh, molten sodium is wonderful heat medium, but incredibly corrosive. So there is issues there with materials. So I would say at the moment, they're trying to avoid that. 
but it's not it's not an impossible idea but at the moment i think they're trying to see can we do it by radiation please belinda can we do it by radiation that's what she's trying to establish have a question online at all free now so Kunyang has asked, um, well, says, thank you very much for the presentation. The question on in-space manufacturing, apart from casting, are there other manufacturing processes for metallic materials that have merits under vacuum and low gravity, in particular, the cooling options being limited, as we were just saying, um, and what does that mean for high molten temperature processes? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you for the question. Um, so, uh, I think the two major um, focuses for manufacturing in, in space manufacturing would be um, casting processes and also additive manufacturing, as as I sort of mentioned. Um, I think a vacuum, um, and now there are experts in the room who are much better at additive manufacturing than I am, so I I, I don't want to say too much in case I get something wrong. But I I know that the um, particularly if we're talking about something like aluminium, which is very reactive with oxygen, um, we're we might see some benefit to uh, not having oxidation in the vacuum. Um, in terms of other high temperature processing, I mean, so the um, another method would be to take directly from melt into uh, like a powder or a pellet form and then use that as an additive manufacturing feedstock. Um, but yeah, because our molten regolith electrolysis process is directly into molten alloy, uh, casting seems like a pretty um, uh, sensible direct route. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, um, I'll just add, um, basically the vacuum is good for avoiding uh, inclusions and, and, yeah. and oxidation, for sure. Um, but the negative is the 1-6 gravity. So most of our separation of impurities on Earth in, in molten metals is by gravity. Mm -hmm. So 1-6 gravity doesn't help that. So there's some ben positive and negatives about the, the, moon's, the uh, moon's environment for making metal quality. But I think casting shapes and 3D printing are the obvious kind of place that they're going to start, I would say. Um, hi. Is there a... <clears throat> just because the entire process of melting the stuff, casting it, processing it, it take a lot of energy where is that energy source going to be coming from yeah so the the main sources are right so first of all direct solar thermal energy so just get mirrors and shine it down and make it hot fun possibility that has the issue of you've got quite a lot of infrastructure but you have also fantastic supply the other approach is to um, use microwave energy to transfer electricity down from solar panels maybe suspended in, uh, above the surface so using solar panels either on the surface or suspended above the surface and using just electricity to drive a microwave or just use electricity in just general electrical melting. So there are two options. Uh, the third option, which some people discuss, I'm not a fan of, is nuclear power type option. But um, I think the more obvious one is to use uh, the solar energy directly. You can, of course, bring up other energy sources, but in terms of using what's available, it's obviously solar energy is the either turning it to electrons or using it directly thermally. These are the smartest ways forward. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for my first year material students coming to my in two doses of me in one week. It's it's rather a lot. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you talked about the significant day-night cycle of on the moon. How would uh, that affect the manufacturing process if half the moon is in complete darkness for half a month? Would you have, say, two manufacturing plants on either side, or we just have one that would only work half a month? How would you deal with that? That's very good thinking you just said, Deb. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, look, I think uh, what people are imagining is, is that I don't think they'd have two manufacturing sites. I think they'd have one and just <laughs> manufacture half the time. <laughs> but I think, of course, eventually you would try to utilise that advantage. But there's also, um, there's also some parts of the moon where the, you know, some of it's in permanent shadow and some of it's um, pretty much in permanent sunlight where you've got, you can take advantage. So there's some debates of where we should locate these things because of that reason. But I think what would honestly happen is that they would just operate on a half a day cycle. 
A good question, good thought. Um, I was going to ask location as well. So you said different parts of the moon have different um, balances of elements. Yes. What are the key factors choosing? I mean, I assume if you want humans, you have to think about water. You've talked about these different manufacturing processes. Yeah, that's, a, that's another perceptive question. Uh, a lot of debate. Um, there, there have been Artemis that have kind of decided where they're going to land and set up the shop and it's near nearish to the South Pole. And I suppose their thinking is that they've got access to water. And I think that will take precedence, right? I think that aspect is likely to take precedence. I think once a habitat was established, you could imagine you know, having another base somewhere else. But I think initially it'll be about where's water? So if we've got water, we can grow things, we can split into oxygen and hydrogen and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then as that becomes a bit more established, and there are people seriously looking at piping systems, because uh, once you've built some pipes, then you can start imagining putting things in other places. Can I tell you, putting pipes on the moon is quite complex. I've got a project with a, an Australian-based company at the moment about that, and you think, oh, pipes on the moon, that should be pretty easy. No, it's not. It's quite involved. There's a lot of details, particularly around the ceiling, like how you seal pipes together and how do you make sure they last. It's not, not easy. But I think initially close to where there's a bit of water and then it would branch out is what I'd expect. But it's a good question. I just want to add, um, I mean, yeah, the ceiling problem is another problem for fill and dust mitigation. That's a huge one. Um, the interesting thing about uh, all of these um, proposals to land at the poles is that we want the water ice, which is predominantly in these permanently shadowed regions that Jeff mentioned. Um, and those tend to be inside craters, but we also want the sunlight, which is, tends to be outside the crater. So you have this sort of interesting logistical issue of, okay, we want to be in two places at once. Um, so that is one of the major challenges that we're facing. And um, so it's it's kind of not necessarily a given like, oh, there's water at the poles, we'll go there. But there's there's a lot there's a lot of complexities added. This thing is, uh, when I mentioned I went to the World Mining Congress and there was a guy there who got up and he was doing his PhD of logistics of supply on the moon. He was already imagining we've got a habitat and he was, trying to work out supply, which is, I thought was really jumping the gun, but <laughs> kind of interesting to think about it. Eh? So yeah, the, the issues you raise are, are really interesting questions. I'm sure there's a lot of people at NASA and ESA thinking about those playoffs, yeah. Last question, Duncan, and then we'll go and have some refreshments. Duncan. Distinguished looking gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the hardest question. I don't know about that, but thanks for the talk. Um, if, if the ultimate, aim is to, to go to Mars, does it make more sense to assemble your spacecraft in orbit and perhaps develop manufacturing technology on the moon as, you know, as a pathfinder to, to that on Mars? And of course, the conditions are different on Mars. You, you, know, you, you could make that same list and, and contrast it. It's more rich in, in iron, for example, the soil. So do you keep this in the back of your minds when you're thinking about manufacturing on the moon that manufacturing yeah, uh, on Mars is-, is My biggest more... hesitation about going onto the moon with human beings is the radiation, right? Because when you look at the, you know, the solar wind coming on the surface of the moon, as I'm sure you know, it's it's absolutely deadly, right? At that period of time. So it is questionable, isn't it, about how sustainable we're going to be on the moon. And I think if we found that we couldn't deal with it, right, it just was you know, too difficult, then I think the strategy you're talking about will become more and more, you know, upfront. Um, my colleague Akbar, he's the Martian. So we have a whole lot of lunatics and we also have a Martian and Akbar is, he's pushing for thing, looking at in making materials on Mars. And there are, as you say, advantages and disadvantages. Um, there are sources of carbon, apparently, you can get on Mars. I don't know enough about it, but it, it, the, so there are some advantages about being on Mars. Um, but yeah, no, I think the scenario you played out is a realistic possibility. I suppose at the moment, we're pushing for the idea that all the other agencies are doing, pushing with, let's try and do it on the moon and see how we go. Um, but I think, I personally think it's the radiation that's the, the dust is not an, it's an easy one either, but I think the radiation is the one that worries me the most. Um, yeah, just on the regular thing, um, uh, yeah, as you, as you very rightly pointed out, it's very iron rich um, on Mars. But I think in terms of, um, and this is something that I worked on when I was at ESA, is the composition of regolith between the moon and Mars is comparable enough that, especially with these, ceramic processes, um, 
they we can pretty much transplant them i mean obviously as we say there's some atmosphere on mars so that provides um maybe some benefit in some areas or some disadvantages if we're trying to make use of the vacuum um but yeah and then when it comes to extracting metals then obviously iron is probably going to be the way to go when we get to the martian surface but um i mean i'm i'm a very strong advocate for we should really sort out the moon first before we jump the gun and go to mars but i think that's a uh, people have different opinions on that that is, uh, that is essentially the strategy of the age it doesn't mean they're right of course but that's their strategy if you look at it and i, I can see sense of that yeah it would, it would be interesting how it goes but as i said for those if you read up about how intense the solar wind can be on the on the moon you understand my concern because it's it suggests you're going to have a lot of have to need a lot of protection at various times well, on that positive yeah. note. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so on that incredibly positive note, thanks, Jeff. Uh, would you please join me in thanking Jeff and Belinda again?